right, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. If you would open up your Bibles to John chapter 16. We're continuing our study going through the Bible. If you remember John chapter 12, Jesus concluded by basically the nation of Israel is in unbelief. And so he's going to concentrate, starting with John chapter 13, on just edifying the little flock. You don't see him going to Israel, uh, apostate Israel anymore. Now his hour is come. It's about time for him to be crucified. <coughs> Excuse me. My allergies are not that great, or they're flourishing depending on how you want to say it. So then in chapter 13, he begins, he washes the disciples' feet. Uh, and then in verse 30, chapter John chapter 13, verse 30, you have Judas Iscariot going out at the commandment of the Lord and to betray him. And so then he begins edifying the little flock. Satan is no longer in his presence because he went with Judas Iscariot to go betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus begins this discourse that goes all the way from John 13, verse 31, through the end of John chapter 16. And he's really preparing the disciples for the tribulation period and also for his death. Uh, so that's what we see in John chapter 16. He is mostly uh, concentrating in John chapter 16 on that tribulation period. Jesus has shared a lot of things with his disciples, and up to this point, they don't understand too much of it, but he assures them that he will send the Holy Spirit after he, after Jesus ascends back to the Father, and when he does, the Spirit will guide them into all truth, and that will be important because during the tribulation period, you have the Antichrist in his kingdom, apostate Israel will make a covenant with the Antichrist, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and they will follow they will follow the Antichrist. And so the world around them will be following false doctrine, and it will appear to the observer that they are following God because they, they'll be using religion. They'll be quoting scripture. They'll be um, claiming that the Antichrist is the true Christ. He is the Messiah when he is not. And so the, the little flock then will have to rely upon God's law covenant God's word revealed to them, the um, the and what the Holy Spirit teaches them through, uh, well, basically what Jesus had taught them, and then the Holy Spirit in turn teaches, guides them into the truth of what He's taught them. The little flock is to go out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. As we saw last week, the Jews, as uh, Paul says in First Corinthians chapter one, the Jews require a sign, and so. They will get a sign. They will be casting out devils. They will be healing the sick. And Jesus gives the little flock the unconditional prayer promise that anything they ask of the Father, he will give them. So that, and the reason is so that they may, so that the lost sheep of the house of Israel may be saved. So in summary, that's what's going on in chapter 16. Just these final instructions before Jesus goes to the cross. So if we pick up in verse 1 there, John 16 verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. We saw, we see that several times in the gospel, Jesus talking about being offended. And it's a reference to being offended in the gospel and um, you know, casting it aside. If you look over in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. There, Jesus is talking about several classes of people during the tribulation period. And one class is one who they believe the gospel of the kingdom, but then when tribulation come they are offended meaning that they abandon the gospel and they put their trust in the antichrist and in apostate israel and so then they end up not entering into the kingdom because they end up denying christ and they do so um, because of the tribulation the persecution that they're facing during the tribulation period as a result of believing and jesus refers to that several times in the gospel as being offended and you see that in matthew chapter 13 verse 20 but he that received the seed into stony places the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it yet hath he no root in himself but doeth for a while for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended 
And so that's the status when we're back in John chapter 16, verse 1. That's the re it says, Jesus says he's spoken these things to them so that they won't be offended in him. Um, there are really two meanings to that. First off is the near fulfillment of that, where they won't be offended in his death. They are expecting, they are looking for a Messiah, a Messiah who would come, overthrow the Romans, set up his kingdom on earth at, right then at that time. Jesus will do that, but it's at his second coming that he overthrows the wicked, not his first coming. The first coming he came to die for their sins. And because the, the, the little flock, the disciples are trusting in religion, what religion has taught them over what God's word says, they will be offended. And we see that over in... Uh, if we, let's see if we look in uh, Matthew 26, what ends up happening, even though Jesus spoke these things to them, chapter 14, chapter 15, and now chapter 16, so that they wouldn't be offended, they end up being offended. And the second meaning of this is in reference to the tribulation period, because in Matthew um, 24 and uh, verse... 13, I believe it is. Yeah, 24 verse 13. Jesus says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Referring to the end of the tribulation period. And so, um, that's another reason why Jesus speaks these things to the little flock, so that they will endure unto the end. Meaning that they will not deny the gospel, they will not deny the Christ, but they, they will not align themselves with the Antichrist. They won't take the image, uh, the mark of the beast, or worship the image of the beast. So that's the goal there of what Jesus is talking about. But unfortunately, in the near fulfillment, then the disciples will endure until the end after the Holy Spirit comes. But before the Holy Spirit comes, they ended up uh, being offended. We see that in Matthew 26, uh, down in verse um, 30, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So even though Jesus speaks these things so that they won't be offended, Jesus says that they will. And you see down in verse 56, Matthew 26, 56, it says, But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So even though Jesus speaks to them, Judas Iscariot's not with them. He speaks already for a little over two chapters. He speaks these things, John 16, 1, that ye should not be offended, they still end up being offended in the gospel, and they flee from Jesus at his death. The good news, though, is the spirit of truth is going to come, as verse 13 says, and he will guide them into all truth. That will be after Jesus' ascension. That's in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost comes down, comes upon them, and then he guides them into all truth so that they are not offended during the tribulation period, and they endure until the end to be saved. So Jesus is warning them uh, of that tribulation period in John 16, now in verse 2. He says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And that's, as I talked about, basically, that's the, since apostate Israel is going to align themselves with the Antichrist, and the Antichrist is going to have this religion that looks like the truth. Paul told the Corinthians, the 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and that he has false ministers appearing to be false apostles of Christ. That's for our dispensation, but it's also going to take place in the tribulation period. Those Jewish religious leaders, they appear to be following God. They have scripture they, they, that supports what they're saying. They, uh, they have a guy who they claim to be the Christ, the Messiah. They say he's fulfilling uh, the Old Testament prophecies so that their Messiah has finally come. And so then you have the little flock who is not going with the request of the Antichrist to take the mark or to worship the image of the beast. And so when the apostate leaders of Israel kill them, they, they will do so in the name of God, saying that they are doing God his service. That they're cleansing out those who are opposing the Messiah. But in fact, that's not the case. It's just the opposite, as Jesus tells them. That these are the people, and you, you notice it is these religious people, because it doesn't say that it's going to be, you know, the president or a governor or a senator or a police officer. But it tells you in verse 2 there, they shall put you out of the synagogues. 
and so it's a religious rule that and those are the ones who take them out and then they think they are by killing them they're doing God a service now verse 3 and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the father nor me the way they know the father and the Lord Jesus Christ is through the gospel they believe they repent meaning they change their mind getting out of their religious system going back to God's law covenant and and so you've got that repentance there then they're water baptized so that they are cleansed as Ezekiel 36 talks about sprinkling clean water upon you you shall be cleansed and that's that's how you know the father or how you know the Lord Jesus Christ they haven't done these things so the apostate nation of Israel aligns themselves with the Antichrist who is under the power of Satan and so they think so they do those things to the little flock in the name of God but they don't really know God because they're not believing God's word. Uh, verse 4 now, But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? So he's saying that he didn't share these things at the beginning, because it's now time for him to be crucified. And then if, if the nation of Israel accepts the gospel of the kingdom then the the tribulation period would start right afterward there is a one year grace period as Luke chapter 13 talks about that that God added to the end of after his after, at the end of the 69th week of Daniel that's when the Messiah would be cut off the 70th week then would be the tribulation period because as John chapter 12 talks about the nation of Israel is in a status of unbelief God added a one-year grace period, which we see in, the, in Acts chapters 2 through 7. And that was a time for Israel to believe the gospel and accept the kingdom of God. If they did that, then that tribulation period would start. And so because the tribulation period is at hand, if, if that was the case, if they did believe, then Jesus is sharing those instructions to the little flock to prepare them for the tribulation period. Uh, notice there in verse 5 he says that no one is asking him whither goest thou well if we go back and uh, let's see John 13 verse 36 John 13 36 it says Simon Peter said unto him Lord whither goest thou Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. So you, they get, well, you know, is this a contradiction? Why is Jesus, did Jesus, for, obviously he's God, he didn't forget. So Jesus says there in John 16, verse 5, that none of you are asking me, Whither goest thou? But yet we saw in John 13, 36, that Simon Peter asked him that very question, word for word, Whither goest thou? And in fact, in John 14, verse 4, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, And whither I go, ye know and the way ye know so Peter asked him Lord where are you going Jesus explains it in the first three verses of John chapter 14 and so then in verse 4 he says well you know where I'm going but yet now he says in John 16 verse 5 no one's asking me where do I go where am I going and the reason is because the word whither can really it can mean two it has two different meanings it can mean uh, to what place or it can also mean to what purpose and so Jesus asked basically where he was going and I'm sorry Peter asked Jesus where he was going back in 13 John chapter 13 verse 36 and Jesus response was that he was going to the father so there they know to what place he's going but when Jesus is talking in John 16 verse 5 the question of whither goest thou they know the place but they don't know the purpose and so he is really going to the to the father the purpose there Jesus answers for them in verse 7 they haven't so they know he's going to the father now he says in John 16 verse 7 you didn't ask me what purpose whither goest thou you didn't ask me what purpose why I'm going to the father now I'm going to tell you and in verse 7 he says nevertheless I tell you the truth it is expedient for you that I go away for if I go not away 
the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And the reason, if you also read verse 13, the Comforter being a reference to the Holy Ghost, as we saw last week, uh, if you look in verse 13, he, Jesus says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, that's the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, same guy, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So, the reason it's important, in other words, Jesus goes away, He's and the purpose he goes away is so that he can send the Comforter, send the Holy Ghost. And you may think, well, what, what's the big deal about that? I mean, Jesus is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. So, you, okay, Jesus goes away, now the Holy Ghost is with them. Well, that's great, but God is God, so why is it important that Jesus goes away and that he sends the Holy Ghost? And it's a couple of reasons. One, and you can see it really in the names that are given to the Holy Ghost here. In verse 7, he's called the Comforter. The tribulation period is going to be the greatest time of persecution that believers will ever face. Uh, in the history of mankind and so they need naturally they need comfort to go through that time and, or otherwise they will not endure into the end of the tribulation period and enter into God's kingdom so Jesus is God that's true but the specific aspect of the of comforting is the Holy Ghost ministry and it's also interesting that that's what we have today we have the God of all comfort because the Holy Spirit is put upon our, our hearts. And if you look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're told in verse 3 about the God of all comfort, and it says in verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort where we, wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So you see a lot of comforting there. Today in the dispensation of grace, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit when we, we are saved, and the Holy Spirit comforts us in our tribulation he also as first corinthians chapter 2 talks about he also guides us into the truth the spiritual things of god well it's no different for even though it's a different dispensation the gospel of the kingdom and them going through the tribulation period in israel's program it's still the holy ghost and the holy ghost really he's god jesus is god and god the father is god but as god all three are god but each one represents a different aspect of God, if you will. And the Holy Ghost aspect is comforting through tribulation. And then in verse 13, John 16, verse 13, it says, it calls him the spirit of truth, and he will guide them into all truth. So he's the one that teaches truth, or so that you can have faith in what God says and endure against Satan's lie program perpetrated by the Antichrist and the apostate nation of Israel. And the reason that's better for the for for the little flock than having Jesus physically there is because that's what they need. They needed Jesus physically there at his first coming so that he could live the perfect life and die for their sins so that they may so that he may loose them from the stronghold of Satan and that they may have eternal life in the kingdom. So that was necessary for him to come but then in the tribulation period it's not necessary for him to die for their sins. He's already done that. So now they need God to comfort them, and they need him to guide them into all truth. You notice when Jesus was there as God, he gave them truth. We, they, he talked about it in chapters 14 and 15. And then in chapter 16, verse 1, he says, I've spoken these things unto you that you should not be offended. But yet we've already seen that they end up being offended anyway. That's not because they didn't have the truth. It's just that they hadn't been guided into all truth and that's the ministry of the holy ghost so they have the truth they end up being offended in the gospel but in the tribulation period they have the holy ghost to guide them into all truth and so then they will endure into the end and so it's important then uh, that this holy spirit comes because it's a different time frame after the messiah is crucified the tribulation period starts and they need the god of all comfort and they need the God that will guide them into truth. And that's the Holy Ghost ministry. So that's why he says in verse 7 that he talks about how it's the reason that I go away is to send you the comforter. 
and he is important because of the different what's going on here in Israel's program the time of the tribulation period so now if we go down to verse 8 it's talking verse 7 talked about the comforter and now in verse 8 we're going to see and through 8 through 11 we're going to see three things that the Holy Ghost does it says and when in verse 8 it says and when he has come he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment so those are three things verse 9 says of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged so let's look at those three things there so the the first thing uh, verse 8 talks about that he will the Holy Ghost is going to reprove the world of sin righteousness and judgment so it's a reproving that he's doing which is basically correcting bad doctrine uh, 2 Timothy 3 16 or maybe it's 17 it talks about in this dispensation uh, 2 Timothy 3 16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction and in righteousness and of course when we get to Paul we're going to see Paul's epistles are laid out in that order where first you get the doctrine then you get the reproof and then you get the correction and so the reproof there is basically correcting um, bad doctrine in other words the application of the doctrine we see that in Paul's epistles you have Romans is the doctrine first and second Corinthians they have the doctrine but they're not following it they don't have the practical application they're the carnal Corinthians and so they need to be reproved and so that's what the Holy Spirit's ministry is in what John 16 verse 8 talks about in the tribulation period and the dispensation of the kingdom I don't mean to mix the dispensations but I hope you can see those verses that will help understand his ministry is a reproving ministry meaning you've got the doctrine out there and but it's just as far because Jesus has revealed it to them and they'll have God's completed word for their program and they'll have the Hebrew epistles Hebrews through Revelation to help them through the tribulation period but yet they will not be practically applying it Israel will not be doing so so the Holy Ghost has that reproving ministry and the first thing it does it says is um, basically it's the he's going to reprove the world as verse 9 says of sin that's regarding them the fact that the nation of Israel as a whole is not believing the gospel of the kingdom the truth is out there but they're not applying it and that they're not believing it and so he's going to uh, reprove them of sin that's what verse says be, verse 9 says because they believe not on me so that's a reference to not believing the gospel of the kingdom then in verse 10 the righteousness part is their righteousness they find their righteousness in the Antichrist or that's what they think they think that they're going to be righteous if they follow that religious system that the Antichrist sets up and the apostate Israel tries to get Israel to follow and so that's the Holy Ghost then is going to also show them first of sin reprove them of sin showing them that they need to believe the gospel secondly it's of righteousness showing them that their self-righteousness or their following the Antichrist is not what's going to bring them into the kingdom and then finally verse 11 he's going to be reproving them of judgment which really shows them because it says in verse 11 because the prince of this world is judged that's Satan so it's going to the Holy Ghost is going to be showing through the through the little flock to the nation of Israel that the one they're following the Antichrist is really a minion of Satan and Satan has already been judged so why are you following him rather you should be following God the Father uh, so that's really what the Holy Ghost does throughout that tribulation period the three things showing them uh, reproving them of sin that they need the gospel reproving them of righteousness that their religion isn't going to bring them into the kingdom and then of judgment showing the one they're following Satan is already been judged and so they need to stop following him in order to enter into the kingdom uh, verse 12 um, Jesus says I have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come so Jesus has already spoken the truth to them 
and then the spirit of truth then is just going to guide them into it the disciples aren't understanding it if they did they wouldn't be offended in him they would they would believe that he that the lord jesus christ was going to die for their sins and that they wouldn't peter wouldn't fight fight him uh, the disciples wouldn't flee for their lives but they would stay with him and so that's the but the holy spirit hasn't guided them into that truth yet he will after the lord jesus christ ascends to the father the holy spirit comes and he will guide them in the truth so that they will endure throughout the tribulation period without uh siding on the antichrist side verse 14 now he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you all things that the father hath are mine therefore said i that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you uh, so you can see the trinity working there it's the father who gave the commandments and to the lord jesus christ and the lord jesus christ says that he didn't do anything or say anything that his father didn't tell him to do or say so it's the father behind the scenes calling the shots it's the lord jesus christ obeying the father and doing and speaking the things that the father wants him to do and speak and then it's the holy spirit's ministry in the tribulation period who comes and he guides the disciples into uh, the truth of God's word and he comforts them through that tribulation period so that's the whole trinity working together in order to bring the little flock safely through the tribulation period and into God's eternal kingdom on earth verse 16 now a little while and ye shall not see me and again a little while and ye shall see me because I go to the father so I think at first glance if you just read that verse people will say oh that's that's easy to see that when he's saying a little while and you shall not see me that's referring to jesus death and that's true and then when it says a little while and you shall see me people think oh well that's the second coming in other words he's not going to be gone that long he's just gonna he's just gonna he's gonna die for their sins that's when they don't see him and then he's gonna come back um and, but it, you know at his second coming or maybe people think it's after his death but really what he's referring to there when it says a little while and ye shall see me that's not referring to jesus second coming and it's not referring to his resurrection from the dead it's referring to the holy ghost coming and the reason you know that is because of this the the dependent clause that's after that where it says ye shall see me because i go to the father well going to the father is always in the book of john it's always correlated to sending the holy ghost that's what he said back in verse 7 where he says it is expedient for you that god that i go away for if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you so in other words the comforter the holy ghost can only come if the lord jesus christ goes to the father so when jesus says in verse 16 a little while and ye shall see me because i go to the father it's a reference to not Jesus' second coming or not to his resurrection from the dead. It's a reference to the Holy Ghost coming. And yet they're going to see him in the ministry of the Holy Ghost because they will see a lot of times in the book of John, you're told Jesus says that the ones who's going to be saved, that has eternal life that goes into the kingdom, are the ones who believe in me, believe in Jesus and so because of that people get this misconception that oh well, that means you have to believe jesus is the son of god or you have to believe in his death burial and resurrection but that's for a different dispensation that reference believe in me means believe in the words i have given you namely believe the gospel of the kingdom and so when he says here ye shall see me then that they are going to see him just like they believe in him they believe his words they are going to see him and through his words that he talked to them they he showed he showed um i don't have a reference here i should have written one down but he showed to them the things of the father when he spoke and and so they could see they could see he he says if i could find something but he says to them if you've seen me you have seen the father meaning if you if you understand what i'm talking to to you about then you know then in other words you've seen the father you've seen him as well and so that's the same thing here with the holy ghost as the holy ghost comes guides him to the truth that jesus has spoken 
then they will see Jesus. They will see the Father, meaning with their spiritual eyes. Israel as a whole has blind, they have eyes they won't see because they are not there in a status of unbelief. When the Holy Ghost comes, he will guide them into the truth. The little flock will then believe. If they believe, then they have the spiritual eyes to see, and they will see the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says in verse 16, a little while and ye shall not see me, he's referencing to the fact that they physically see him now. He's going to be crucified, then they won't see him physically. But then when they see him a little while and ye shall see me, through the Holy Ghost, that's when they will see him spiritually. So they've seen him physically, but later they will see him spiritually. And that's why it's so important that he goes away. It's much more important to see Jesus spiritually than it is to see him physically. If seeing him physically was so important, he would be here physically um, in every dispensation at all times so that every person who has ever lived could physically see him. But the only people who ever physically saw him were these were the ones here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, also Paul, and you know, there are a few exceptions. But the, the point is, the vast majority of the people on earth, even believers, even those who have eternal life, have never physically seen Jesus. But the reason they have eternal life is they have spiritually seen him through believing in the word that they've been given, uh, the gospel that they have been given. <laughs> So that's what the little while and ye shall see me refers to, the spiritually see them. Now in verse 17, Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Verse 19, Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. So that's another reason that we know he's not referring to his resurrection. If you go back to Luke 24, um, after he resurrected and they realized it was Jesus, they were very excited about it. Then after he ascends, they are excited as well. Uh, it says there in Luke 24, verse uh, 51, it says, And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So there's Jesus' ascension. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So here they are rejoicing. Jesus isn't there though. Physically speaking, he's ascended to the Father. So they, but they are rejoicing during that time, meaning in that tribulation period, um, they, they are going to be rejoicing. And in the fact that they have the Holy Ghost there with them. So in that tribulation period, it says the, that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Uh, a woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she de is, is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So you have there that tribulation period. The woman there is a reference to the nation of Israel. When she is in travail, she has sorrow. That's sort of the birth pains. That's when they are... Remember Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, then unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And they are born again by believing the gospel. And then they are born, Jesus brings them to the birth. They are born again when they enter the, when he comes back that second time. So they are in, being in travail and having that sorrow then refers to that tribulation period when they weep and lament. But then the world, they're going to rejoice because... It's the time of the world during that time. Satan is ruling. The prince of the world is in charge. Satan is in charge. Uh, they're prospering economically. They're prospering uh, you know, with power as far as that's concerned. And so people are rejoicing, but yet the little flock, because they are not of this world, they are in Jesus, they are kept in him, then they are going to be weeping and lamenting. And so that is a reference to, in verse 21, that woman, she's in travail, has sorrow. So, in other words, Israel is pregnant or being ready to give birth to the saved Israel uh, at the end of the tribulation period. And 
as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So once Israel is born again and they enter the kingdom, that's when, as verse 20 says, their sorrow shall be turned into joy. And so uh, during that tribulation period, they are going to have sorrow just going through those times where the world is against them. Israel is against them. The Antichrist is against them. And, but then that will be turned into joy at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus comes back. That is when Israel is born again. Verse 22, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. So they will have sorrow, they will weep and lament, but if they have the Holy Spirit, if they are part of the little flock there, then they can have joy. Jesus said back in uh, John uh, chapter, where is it, 15, verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And I mentioned at that time about where Matthew chapter 10 talks about how they're going to be persecuted, they're going to be arrested, some of them will be killed, uh, the whole world will hate them. And so they got all these circumstances that are against them, and that's why they're going to weep and lament during that time. However, if they are keeping God's commandments, which is to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and go from city to city, even though they are persecuted, they will have full joy because the Holy Ghost is with them, comforting them during that tribulation period. And they will be doing the Father's will, and so they will have joy doing the Father's will. And so you have at the same time, you have a couple things going on. They will weep and lament over the fact that, uh, over the, the things that are going on with, you know, Jesus said in the, and Matthew chapter 5, you know, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so they are going to weep and lament during the tribulation period. But at the same time, they shall, they shall have, their hearts shall rejoice. They will have joy in their hearts if they are keeping God's commands. And so they will have the Holy Ghost with them, bringing them joy. And they will have joy in that uh, during that time. And that's why it says in verse, and that's another reason why you can see that the little while of verse 16, when he will come back to them, has to be a reference to the Holy Ghost coming. Because he says there in verse 23, In that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, what serve ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. So you have this transition period where before they were asking Jesus for something. Now they will be asking the Father directly because they have the Holy Ghost within them. And the Father will give it to them as that unconditional prayer promise. So that as they're going out, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Sure, they're weeping and they're sorrowful in the things that are going out in the circumstances. But inwardly, in their heart, they have true joy. And during that time, the Holy Ghost, because the Jews seek a sign, the, the little flock will go out. They'll minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the Holy Ghost will you know, they will have that discernment as to know if this is somebody who is a true believer or not you can see that over in John chapter 20 and verse uh, 22 when he had said this he breathed on them and said unto them receive ye the Holy Ghost whosoever sins ye remit they are remitted unto them and whosoever sins ye retain they are retained so during that tribulation period, they will have the Holy Ghost. Only God can forgive sins. Well, they will be acting on behalf of God. The Holy Ghost will be guiding them into the truth to allow them to see if someone is, if they are truly someone who has believed the gospel of the kingdom. If that's the case, then the disciples will remit their sins and say, your sins be forgiven you. But if they're not true believers, if they were just, you know, agreeing but in their heart they haven't believed that gospel well then they're not going to have their sins remitted so when they go out it shows really that the Holy Ghost is showing them what's in the heart of man and that person's if they are having faith or if they're not having faith 
And so when they go out to the lost sheep, they because the Holy Ghost is revealing those things to them, he will also reveal to them what is necessary, what sign those lost sheep need in order to become found sheep. And so that's when they will ask of anything that, uh, in the Father name and the father will give it to them meaning he will give them that miracle that sign that they need to show the lost sheep of the house of Israel so that they may be saved and then when they do believe the gospel of the kingdom they repent they are water baptized well then their sins will be remitted the disciples will remit those sins for them uh, under the power of the Holy Ghost and they will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost as well as Acts 2 38 speaks about so that's what he's referencing there uh, so after a little while the Holy Ghost comes they'll be weeping and sorrowful in the outward circumstances they'll have joy inwardly they will preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the lost sheep will be saved through the signs that the that they ask the father to perform so that they may be saved now that's the you know it seems like there's a lot of code here it's kind of hard to understand what's going on and that's what Jesus says there in verse 25. He says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. I, I think it's interesting he uses the term Proverbs because in other places it's parables. Uh, I think the difference here is that parable is really a story that's told. And he'll tell, you know, the parable of the sower. And it's a story to tell, reveal a deeper spiritual truth. But it's also coded where it's only those who have the spiritual ears to hear will understand. A proverb, on the other hand, is still something that is not easily discerned. You have to have the spiritual ears to hear and the spiritual eyes to see what Jesus is saying. But the difference is it's not a story. He hasn't given them and what he's spoken to them. You don't have a story of you know, the parable of the talents, the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares. You don't have a story. He's just revealing to them truth. But the truth is veiled in such a way that if you just take a natural reading of it you're not going to understand what in the world he's talking about what I've gone over here has been difficult for me to explain and I hope you've understand what I said and but we also had to look at scripture the only way I was able to understand it is to look at other scripture and the Holy Spirit had to teach me teach the spiritual man inside me what it's talking about and so that's what a proverb is Jesus is speaking spiritual truths that the natural man can't understand, but it's not in story form. So instead of being a parable, it's a proverb. And that's also a good reason why the, the book of Proverbs, that is a book for the little flock going through the tribulation period. And the natural man who reads it really wouldn't understand that. Most Christians who read the book of Proverbs, reading it in the flesh, having not rightly divided the word of truth, will look at it and think, well, these are things, you know, wise sayings that I should, that will help me in my life. Whereas, really, the truth behind what is said in the Proverbs is for the little flock to go through the tribulation period. And it's only when you rightly divide and allow the Spirit to teach you His truth forsaking the lust of the flesh walking in the spirit as you read God's word that you can understand what the Proverbs mean uh, so to hear that's the only way you can understand these verses is it's only for those who have the spiritual ears to hear and the eyes to see in this dispensation we have the Holy Spirit to guide us we just have to yield to what God says believe in God's word as our final authority rather than relying on religion to interpret even Christian religion to interpret for us what it's saying so verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. That's when the Holy Ghost comes. He will guide them unto all truth, so that they will plainly understand what he's saying. Verse 26, at that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. So again, at that day, referencing that time during the tribulation period when the little flocks preach in the gospel of the kingdom, and they have that unconditional prayer promise in order for the lost sheep of the house of Israel to be saved. Verse 28, I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and go to the Father. So again, that's the reference to, it's so important, Jesus saying that I die, so that you may be saved so your sins can be forgiven but also so that I might send the Holy Spirit and you can understand these things and I'm telling you right now you can't understand them uh, then verse 29 his disciples sent unto him 
Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that uh, now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Now Jesus says, Jesus had said that well, the disciples here say that you are speaking plainly; you are not speaking a proverb. But yet Jesus says up in verse 25, he says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. So who should we believe here? And he says, he says, you know, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. So he's saying, I'm speaking to you in Proverbs right now. But in the future, I will be speaking plainly. And that's through the Holy Ghost speaking to them in the, through, during the tribulation period. The disciples, they say, oh, you're speaking to us plainly now. You're not speaking in Proverbs. Well, who should we believe? Obviously, we should believe the Lord Jesus Christ here. And that you can see the response of the disciples where he, where they say in verse 30, Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. So, in other words, the disciples are saying, Okay, well, we understand what you're saying. You're saying that you came from God, and that you know all things, and so you don't need to follow man's religion uh, like we've been doing, like Israel's been doing, following what the Jewish religious leaders say, but rather you're following your truth that you're giving, you're following directly from God, so we understand that. But that's not what Jesus was trying to convey to them. And it shows in the fact that it, sh it confirms that Jesus was speaking in Proverbs. Because they say, oh, well, you're speaking plainly. We understand what you're saying. Here's what you're saying. Well, that's not at all what he's saying. What he is saying there in verses 16 through 20, uh, 23, we just uh, got, went over that, as he was saying that the, that, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to, during the tribulation period, you're going to have tough times, but the Holy Spirit is going to give you joy and comfort in your heart. And then he's going to guide you into God's truth, and he's going to, do miracles through you and you're going to remit sins of people so that the lost sheep of the house of Israel may be saved and enter God's kingdom. That's what he was teaching them. That was the, the explanation of the proverb. But yet, what they say is completely different. It's, well, we know that you don't need to follow religion, that, that you know all things, you come from God. Uh, and so that's completely different from what he just said. So it confirms that Jesus was not speaking plainly unto them. He was speaking in Proverbs, and we know this because Jesus said he was speaking in Proverbs. And then we also know that the disciples do not understand the interpretation of what Jesus said because he was speaking in Proverbs. They understand something different, which what he says, what they say here in verse 30 is true, that he did come from God, that he does know all things, and that he is not following what man tells him or following religion. Those are all true statements. It's just that is not what Jesus was teaching them. Um, if it was, then Jesus was lying because he, Jesus said he was speaking in Proverbs when he was really speaking plainly. Of course, that's not the case. Jesus was speaking in Proverbs, and we went over the meaning of that, which is completely different than what the disciples got out of it in verse 30, which confirms that they really do need the Holy Spirit to come to guide them into all truth because they can't understand this proverb that Jesus has spoken to them. <laughs> And so then Jesus asked them in verse 31, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So that time when they leave him, as of course, as we read earlier in Matthew 26, verse 56, where they will, uh, they will flee from him when he is arrested, in fear that they will lose their lives themselves. And... You also remember what Jesus said to them. He says, you don't, those who try to keep them, their lives shall lose it, but those who lose their lives for my sake shall find it. That was a reference, but that's during the tribulation period. That if you're willing to lose your life being killed by the Antichrist or by apostate Israel, and you do that for the gospel's sake, well, then you're going to have eternal life in the kingdom. But if you deny me and you try to keep your life, so you take the mark of the beast or you worship the image of the beast, well, then you will lose your life, and you will not enter into God's kingdom. But yet, and so that's what the disciples and what the little flock will do during the tribulation period. They will not forsake the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not take the mark of the beast. They will not worship the image of the beast. They will not align themselves with the Antichrist. But here, 
the disciples do forsake Jesus. They do flee. They do align themselves with the religious leaders. That shows how important it is that the Holy Ghost comes. Even though they got Jesus there, even though he's God, they're not guided into all truth. They're not understanding it. They're not following God. That shows how they need the Holy Ghost. And so when when Jesus is arrested, they are going to flee. They are going to scatter. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. Um, and we read that passage earlier, Matthew 26, verse 56. Uh, verse 33, now, these things I have spoken unto you, then in me ye might have peace. So again, because the Holy Ghost is with them during the tribulation period, and they understand these things, even though all circumstances around them are against them, they will have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, that, you know, that scripture is quoted a lot by Christians today to try to apply today. And certainly... There is, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 earlier, that there is tribulation in the gospel of the kingdom, I mean, in the gospel of grace, in this current dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God, the body of Christ. We do suffer tribulation. We say, you know, Romans 8 talks about the sufferings of this present time, and uh, referring to also physical and also spiritually speaking. And we should be of good cheer because we know that. We have eternal life, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we have already received the atonement, and that we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rapture us up and we're going to be and we're already seated in heavenly places with Christ. So it is true that today we will have tribulation and that we should be of good cheer because our Lord has overcome the world. But this is a different aspect here in that he's talking about the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period that the little flock will go through. But yet during that time of the worst persecution that believers will ever face, they can still have peace because of the Holy Ghost is with them and they will trust. If they trust in God's word, they believe what God has told them, they will have peace despite of what is the circumstances going on around them. So basically that's the end of what Jesus talks to his disciples there. Um, and we've, you know, we've gone over the, the chapters. He's revealed his plan about how he's going to ascend to the Father. He's going to prepare a place for them in the kingdom, positions of authority. So when New Jerusalem comes down on earth, then they will be in the kingdom. They will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Chapter 16, we went over how the, that the Holy Spirit is going to get them through the tribulation period and how important the Holy Spirit is because they weren't doing it under Jesus' ministry just because the Holy Spirit has a different aspect of God, the comfort and guiding them, uh, guiding them into truth. And so that's why the Holy Ghost is so important in the tribulation period. So now we get to chapter 17. Now Jesus is going to pray for them. This is the true Lord's Prayer. The, the Lord's Prayer is not Matthew chapter 6. That's what he taught his the little flock to pray during the tribulation period. But chapter 17 of the book of John is where Jesus, as God, prays for, for the little flock going through the tribulation period. And you can see the contrast between the, the different aspects that are shown of Jesus, the different gospels. Matthew shows Jesus as king. Mark shows him as servant. Luke shows him as the perfect man. John shows him as God. And you can see the contrast between man and God just looking at the different prayers. Because if you go over to Luke chapter 22, the prayer that Luke shows is of him in the garden. And in Luke 22, verse 41, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. So you see there the perfect man, Jesus as the perfect man portrayed by Luke. His prayer is, I don't want to die. Take this away from me. But yet, I... Father, I yield my will to your will. And he, and you can see as a man, he is sweating in agony, great drops of blood, not wanting to go to the cross, but yet finally yielding his will to the Father and going to the cross. That's what the perfect man does. That's the prayer of the perfect man. 
the prayer of God, though, is John chapter 17. We do not see in the book of John Jesus praying in the garden in agony. Rather, we see him just before he gets to the garden. He does this prayer here where he prays for, number one, verses 1 through 5, he prays for glory for the Father, that the Father will be glorified through Jesus' death. Number two, in verses 6 through 19, he prays for endurance for the little flock. He's already shared in chapter 16 about how they're going to go through the tribulation period, uh, and the Holy Spirit's going to help them. Now he's praying for them to allow the Holy Spirit to work through them, reveal to them the truths of God's word so that they will endure until the end and be saved. That's verses 6 through 19. And then uh, the last part there, verses 20 through 26, he prays for the expansion of the little flock. So you've already got this little flock of believers, but now he prays that it will expand to all the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Most of them are still lost at this point. So you can see the contrast here. John chapter uh, Luke showing Jesus as the perfect man shows him praying, I don't want to go to the cross, but I'll do it, Father. And But then John shows Jesus as God, and as God, he doesn't pray for himself. He doesn't pray about him going to the cross. He's praying for glory for the Father, verses 1 through 5, endurance for the little flock in verses 6 through 19, and expansion of the little flock in verses 20 through 26. So there's the contrast there between, you know, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And how that all worked, I don't know. But if you want to see the difference between Jesus as man and Jesus as God, you only need to compare his prayer here in John 17 with his prayer in Luke 22 in the garden. So as God, he prays, and let's go through this through this prayer here. Uh, verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lift up his eyes to heaven and said, you know, it's interesting as a side note that Jesus lift up his eyes to heaven in prayer. Uh, you you don't really, when Jesus prayed, that's what you see him do. I think there may be one instance in the book of Mark where he actually uh, bowed his head in prayer. I don't remember that scripture offhand. But uh, for the most part, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he prayed. And it's just, yeah, it's just an interesting thing. I think that the bowing of the head that we do today is more of a tradition type thing. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's just... It's just interesting that we bow our heads in reverence and close our eyes, whereas Jesus actually lifted up his eyes to heaven and prayed. So he said there, Father, the hour is come. So that means the hour of his death is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So the way he is glorified there is you know, through his death. And also, then in turn then, God the Father is going to be glorified and the way the glory happens is because really it's that remember Satan has Israel as his lawful captive as, as his lawful captive they are bound by him and even if you have a believing remnant who believe the gospel there is still no power to bring them into eternal life they can't see God in fact those Old Testament saints who believe they're in Abraham's bosom they're in hell as you could say the the abraham's bosom aspect of hell they're not in torments but they're in hell they're in the grave there in abraham's bosom because there is no power for them to be brought into god's presence and so the way god gets glory uh, through the death of the lord jesus christ is that that power had overcome death and hell and to be able to take those who believe the gospel in all dispensations to bring them into eternal life with god and, of course, that's so that's how God gets the glory, both the Son and the Father. And we see that in verse 2. It says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh. So that's he gives him power through resurrecting from the dead, the power over the death, so that he now can resurrect into life. Uh, as Verse 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So only to that doesn't mean every single person is going to be saved. But it's only those who believe the gospel that they are given who are going to be saved. Verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And they know him by believing the word that he's given them, believing the gospel. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So he did the work as far as verse 12 tells you that work, where he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. So you had the believing remnant 
but the Jewish religious leaders are uh, the Jewish religious leaders are trying to get steer them away and get them into a religion and a lot of people are doing that but yet the little flock the true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ Jesus has kept them safe and he's also brought some of the lost sheep uh, to become found sheep by the preaching of the gospel and the evidence given the casting out of devils and the healing of the sick so that is the work with which God gave God the Father gave him to do of course then the other aspect of the work then is also going to be him dying on the cross for the sins of Israel so that they may have that eternal uh, life through the power that he has over death uh, the resurrection power through his sacrifice on the cross uh, so he's finished the work which he gave him to do verse 5 and now O father glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was so that's that's really a great statement because before the world was you had everybody in harmony with God but then what happened was Satan fell Revelation chapter 12 talks about how Satan took one-third of the Lucifer was his name then Lucifer took one-third of the angels with him he was cast down because he rebelled against God and now the heavenly places are unclean in his sight then Satan gets Adam and Eve to sin and through Adam's sin you have the curse of sin now you have the fall of the earth so now the earth is cursed so the earth is unclean and the heavens are unclean but before the world began the heavens were clean and so Jesus says there uh, in verse 5 where he says O Father glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was what Jesus is saying is he recognizes as God he recognizes that as Jesus the man dies for the sins of Israel and eventually for uh, as we'll find out in Paul's epistles if it's also for the sins of the entire world that brings God glory in that it cleans up those heavenly places and the earth as well so that all the universe will be eventually it won't be until after uh, after Satan is finally cast into the lake of fire which is after the millennial reign after he's loose for a little season and after that final battle there uh, at the Battle of Armageddon there that's when finally that glory that Jesus had with the Father where the heavenly places and the earth the entire universe is clean in the eyes of God sin is cast out that will finally take place in uh, at that time and Jesus prays for that because Jesus realizes is the key ingredient the key thing that makes that all take place for the he both the heavenly realm and the earthly realm to be clean is his death on the cross now the heavenly realms being cleansed that wasn't revealed until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 that was a mystery that was kept secret until that time but of course God knows about it and Jesus as God then would recognize that that's what's taking place here is that the entire heavenly earth all the universe is going to be clean in his sight that's still future but it's all made possible through his death even though the gospel of believing in Jesus death as atonement for your sins is only for this dispensation it is all people are saved through his blood that I'm saying all those who believe whatever gospel they're given in their dispensation they they are saved by believing that gospel only because Jesus died for their sins and so Jesus is recognizing that his death is going to cleanse out sin and it's going to restore the order that was there that took place before Satan rebelled and before man fell that was before the world was verse 6 I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world thine they were and thou gavest them me and they have kept thy words now he's shifting over to endurance of the little flock throughout the tribulation period verse 7 now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee so they do know that part but they don't really know Holy Ghost hasn't come he hasn't guide them into truth all truth as we've we talked about what uh, that proverb that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 16 so since that hasn't taken place yet Jesus is praying that it will take place and it's not that God is weak and he won't be able to fulfill it or that the oh, Holy Ghost won't be able to do it but it's just that that the little flock he's praying for the little flock that they may believe what the Holy Ghost teaches them that they may believe the gospel that they may believe 
the things of God rather than believing what the Antichrist and his religious system says during the tribulation period. So, uh, verse 7, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So they do have what he spoke to them plainly, what, what they said in John 16, verse 30 that they re recognize that he knows all things. He needs not that any man should ask thee. And he, uh, they believe that he came forth from God. So those are the things that Jesus repeats here in John 17, verse 8, because they do know those things. But there's still a lot that they still need to know. And so that's why he's praying for them. Verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now, he does want the lost sheep of Israel to be found. He does want all the world to be saved. And so it's not that he's not praying for the world. Rather, he is not praying for the world system. He is praying for the little flock. Uh, if we look over in uh, the next chapter over, and John 18, verse 36, it says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. And if you also go over to uh, Revelation chapter, well, we'll we're going to cover John 18 later. We'll, we'll get to that later. But uh, the point is that Jesus is saying his kingdom is not of this world. So when he says over in John 17, verse Nine, that he prays not for the world he's not praying for the world system because his kingdom isn't of this world rather he's praying for God's kingdom and God's kingdom is comprised of saved Israel which is the little flock at this time so he prays for them verse 10 John 17 verse 10 all are all mine are thine and all and thine are mine and I am glorified in them and now I am no more in the world but these are in the world and I come to thee holy father keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So the prayer there in verse 11, Jesus is not going to be in the world anymore because he's going to, his time has come to die. Then he will ascend to the Father 40 days after his resurrection. But yet the little flock is going to have to go through that entire tribulation period. They're going to have to endure until the end to be saved. That's why they need prayer. They're going to continue to be persecuted and tried by the religious system. And he prays for the Holy Father. He says, keep them through thine own name, that they may be one as we are. And we'll get to the oneness a little later. Uh, he goes into more detail a little later in the prayer. So uh, verse 12 then, he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. That was the work that the Father gave him to do. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus said earlier in the book of John that he says uh, no, that no man can take them out of my hand. He also says that no man can take them out of my Father's hand, which shows that uh, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are one, as he stated there. But it shows that he has kept them. Those, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, they have, I'm sorry, the little flock have believed him in him. And even though the apostate Israel is persecuting the little flock, Jesus still kept them safe by giving them God's truth. And except for, he mentions Judas Iscariot, because he was not God's anyway. He ends up uh, being offended in the, in the gospel of the kingdom. And he's not going to be part of God's kingdom because he betrays the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, Now come I to thee, so God is... Jesus is going back to the Father. Now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And we read that earlier. If they keep his commandments, namely, they preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, they will have the Holy Spirit dwelling with them, and they will have full joy. Uh, verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou sh that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So it's not time for, Jesus is going to be taken out of the world, but it's not time yet 
for the little flock to be taken out of the world because they have to endure through the tribulation period. And it's really, they need to reach the, they need to preach the gospel. If you go over to Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, I know we've referred to this before. In Matthew 10, verse 6, he tells them uh, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So they are to go from city to city in Israel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And Matthew 10, verse 23, so they're going to, and the reason is so that the lost sheep of the house of Israel may be found. And in Matthew 10, verse 23, it says, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Well, he comes, that's his second coming, that's at the end of the tribulation period. So the reason that God doesn't take them out of the world, I mean, they, they should have eternal life, they believe the gospel, and they're going to have eternal life in the kingdom, but yet they endure through the wor in, the, in the world throughout the tribulation period because there are still lost sheep. There are still sheep to be found to be saved to enter into the kingdom. And those lost sheep, incidentally, cannot be found, or will not be found, I should say, until they have to make a choice in the tribulation period. And that's why you have the, you know, where they have to choose, where either they're going to choose to align themselves with the Antichrist and live. They're, they're either going to choose for their flesh to live, or they're going to choose for their soul to live. If they choose to take the mark of the beast or worship the image, then they're choosing for their flesh to live, and then their soul will be cast into the lake of fire. Of course, their flesh is going to be uh, burned up as well, but um, their soul cast into the lake of fire. But then, if they choose to uh, believe the gospel over what the Antichrist says, well, then they will have eternal life, be in God's kingdom. So the tribulation period forces all of Israel to make a choice. They either align themselves with the Antichrist and Satan, or they align themselves with God by believing the gospel and enduring until the end of the tribulation period. So it forces them to make that choice. And the little flock, those who have already made the choice to believe the gospel, they have to still go through the entire tribulation period so that they may reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's why in John 17, verse 15, Jesus says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, even though he loves them, he doesn't want them to be in the world. He loves the lost sheep, and they need to enter the kingdom as well. But then he prays for them that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So in other words, he prays for them to stay in the world so that they may reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But that he also prays, but he prays for them so that they will endure until the end, so that they won't become... Uh, this, so that they won't become apostate, they won't be offended in the gospel, so that they won't align themselves with the Antichrist. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Um, basically, sanctification here is reference to being set apart or being holy. And the way that the little flock of Israel is set apart or sanctified from the apostate nation of Israel as a whole is through the truth. They believe the words that God has told them. The Holy Ghost will teach them those words, uh, guide them into all truth, as we saw in John 16, verse 13. And so then, uh, so then they will be set apart from Israel. Apostate Israel aligns themselves with the Antichrist. They're on one side. Little flock saved Israel, believes God's word. They're on the other side. And the way they do that is the truth. The battle is always between God's truth and Satan's lie program. Those are the two extremes there. And if they believe God's truth, they will be sanctified. They will be set apart. So it doesn't matter what the Antichrist and the apostate Israel says to them. They will recognize it's a lie, and the way they recognize it's a lie is because they know the truth, and they know the truth because they have heard God's word, and the Holy Ghost has guided them into that truth. And so Jesus is praying for them that if they're going to be in the world and there's evil all around them, they need to be set apart from the world, even though they're in the world, and they're set apart through the truth of God's word. And so he prays for the Father to sanctify them through thy truth, and that's done through the Father 
uh, through the, through Jesus sending the Holy Ghost and guiding them into the truth. Verse uh, 18, as thou, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Now, the way the Father sent Jesus into the world was, if you remember, he gave him a position of authority in his kingdom. Jesus came. He's going to die on the cross. But then, through his death, Israel may be saved. They may enter into the kingdom. As 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about, he's going to, after, well, Psalm 110 verse 1 says, Jesus says, or the Father says unto Jesus, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then when that time comes, then he comes back his second coming. He destroys the wicked. And then he uh, has the kingdom. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about God the Father giving him the kingdom. In fact, let's, let's look at that so you can better understand what's going on here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, verse 23 but every man in his own order Christ the first fruits afterward they that are Christ at his coming then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the father so that's at the when he comes back his second coming he judges the world it says when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he hath put all en enemies under his feet the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death and for he hath put all things under his feet but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So God the Father sends the Lord Jesus Christ to die for the sins of Israel. Then when he comes back the second time, he's going to judge them. As a result, God the Father gives God the Son a position of authority in that he's going to be over the entire kingdom on the earth with the exception of God the Father still being over God the Son. But God the Son is going to be over everybody else. So that's the position of it. That's how God sent him. And so, and so that's why going back now to John 17 verse 18, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So that's a reference to you know, basically the responsibility of bringing the kingdom in, God's kingdom in, and as a result, with that responsibility comes the right to have a position of authority in the kingdom. If you look over in Luke chapter 22 and verse 29, Luke 22 verse 29 confirms what I'm saying. He says, And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So when Jesus says there in John 17 verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. It's a reference to God the Father sent God the Son into the world to reconcile Israel back to him, recon uh, to back to God the Father. And as a result, God the Son would have a position of authority in the kingdom. So, too, God the Son sends the lost sheep of the house of Israel to reconcile the lost sheep back to... I'm sorry, he sends the little flock to reconcile the lost sheep of the house of Israel back to God. And as a result, they get a position in God's kingdom just like God the Son gets a position in God's kingdom. And then verse 19, Luke, uh, John 17, verse 19 and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now, that might seem like a, you know, a weird passage here. I mean, why, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is Jesus praying as God. He is perfect. He has, even as man, he is perfect. He never sinned. So sanctification, as far as holiness is concerned, it, that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, why would he, why would Jesus sanctify himself? He's already holy. How can God make himself any more holy than he already is? You know, you're either holy or you're not. He's holy. Uh, and that's what the scripture meant. Um, uh, but basically, uh, what it means here 
is uh, you really have the word sanctify can mean two different things it can mean to make holy or to cleanse but it can also mean to set apart as we talked about earlier and so both meanings are seen in this verse you have Jesus Christ sanctifies himself meaning he sets himself apart in order that the little flock might be sanctified in order for the little flock to be made holy or to be cleansed the way Jesus Christ sanctifies himself he sets himself apart that's the sanctification he sets himself apart as the propitiation for the sins of, of Israel he sets himself apart as that substitutionary sacrifice uh, Galatians chapter 3 I believe it's verse 13 or somewhere in there right, let's turn over there real quick so you'll know where it is and also so that I don't misquote it um, Galatians 3 uh, yeah verse 13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree so he was made a curse so in other words what, what, it, what that verse is saying is that the law the law says the law is holy and it's just and it's good and it sets up this perfect standard anybody who sets that meets that perfect standard receives eternal life receives righteousness the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who ever met that perfect standard everybody else did not meet it so everybody else is under the curse of the law not receiving eternal life Jesus Christ then sets himself apart as the curse he has made a curse for us so that we may receive life and so that's how he sets himself apart so that's why John 17 verse 19 when he says for their sakes I sanctify myself in other words, he's already holy but he sets himself apart and he does it for their sakes in other words he sets himself apart as the curse for sin he makes himself sin he has made sin so that he can be that substitutionary death for sin so that those who have sinned which is everybody else who's ever lived if they believe the gospel they're given by God then they have Jesus substitutionary death as atonement for their sins and they have eternal life so he sanctifies himself he sets himself apart as that substitutionary death for their sakes in other words so that they may have life and also so that they may be holy through the truth that they also might be sanctified through the truth so they receive eternal life through substitutionary death but they also receive the Holy Ghost who is going to guide them into all truth as verse 17 says so really it's an explanation of verse 17 where it says sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth and the way it happens is Jesus has to set himself apart as a substitutionary death for sin they believe the gospel repent and be baptized for their mission of sins so then they then receive the Holy Ghost as Acts 2 38 says repent and be baptized for their mission of remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost then sanctifies them makes them holy setting them apart from apostate Israel as we talked about in verse 17 and it does so through the truth through God's Word so there are two sanctifications there and two different meanings of the word sanctify uh, so Jesus does not make himself holy he already is holy rather he's sanctified in the sense of setting him apart setting himself apart as that substitutionary death for sin now in verses 20 through 26 so he's already prayed for the endurance of the little flock through the tribulation period so that they will endure until the end which is only possible if they have the Holy Ghost guide them into all truth because if they don't believe that truth they're going to believe the lie program perpetrated by the Antichrist and by apostate Israel and by most of the world uh, so Jesus prays that they may be allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify them through the truth of God's Word so that they may endure until the end of the tribulation period they are also supposed to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel so that they may also enter into God's kingdom and so now Jesus prays this last prayer here in verses 20 through 26 the last portion of the prayer here he prays for them 
for the lost sheep that they may be saved that they may believe that gospel and enter the kingdom so verse 20 John 17 verse 20 neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their words so that's that lost sheep of the house of Israel verse 21 that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me so the way they are one they're not just one in themselves as far as being unified among themselves I mean they're well, well let's keep reading them then I'll get to that uh, verse 22 and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one I and them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me so you have the unity verse 21 talks about that where the little flock is united but it's not enough just for them to be united. In other words, having the same message, living the same lifestyle, you know, living a godly life in this case. But it's not you know, being united. There, are, You'll see that in the world there are tons of examples of people being united in a cause. And in fact, that's what 9-11 was all about, the terrorist attacks. The terrorists who attacked the United States were united in a cause. That doesn't mean they were united in a good way. They were united in a bad way, but they were united. So unity in itself is not necessarily good, but rather their unity, they have to be united in, in God. And that's what verse 23 talks about. So in verse 21, the prayer is that they may be one, they may be unified. And the reason is so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So if they, if you've got some members of the little flock who don't, obey the law and they don't preach the gospel of the kingdom and they're and they believe religion they believe what apostate Israel has taught rather than believe in the truth of God's word well then the world is going to get conflicting messages given to them and they are less likely to believe and so then the lost sheep of the house of Israel aren't found so God is praying for unity but not just unity in itself because as we saw unity is a bad thing Genesis sometimes it's a bad thing in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel the whole world unites in building a tower and rebel they unite in their rebellion against God but the unity must not just be within themselves but they also must be united in God and that's what verse 23 talks about where he says I in them so that's God in them and thou in me that's the father in them that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me so you have again the whole trinity working you have i and then the father i'm sorry the jesus christ in the little flock the father in jesus christ and the holy ghost ministering in the little flock guiding them into all truth and that's how the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me so when the little flock goes out and preaches the gospel of the kingdom, if they are yielding to what the Holy Ghost teaches them, the truth of God's word, and they believe that over the religion of the lie program, of the, the religion of the Antichrist, the Babylonian religious system that we see in the book of Revelation, if they are all abandoning that and they are trusting solely in God's word, they are sanctified through the truth of God's word, through the Holy Ghost working through them, then they are united in God and God is in them such that when they go out and preach that gospel of the kingdom the world will see that yes this is true they have the evidence the signs of the kingdom and they're also obeying God's word and so those who have the the, the lost sheep those who are seeking for God seeking to be found by God will be found by him through that ministry that the gospel of the kingdom that the little flock gives them and through the life that they are living Obey in God such that they may be saved, so that the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel may be saved. So the unity there, uh, it's important that they are united, but united in God and united in obeying what the Holy Ghost te uh, guides them into the truth and obeying the commands of the Father and what Jesus has taught them as the commands of the Father to go out and preach that gospel uh, during the tribulation period. So that's the, the unity portion there. Now in verse 24, he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. 
for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So he said in verse 5 that through the cross, the glory was going to be reestablished back as it was before the foundation of the world, before Satan rebelled and before man fell. And now he's praying. Now he's saying that, you know, he wants them to be, he wants Israel to be with them to see that glory and to be part of that glory program. And that is accomplished through them, through the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If the lost sheep of the house of Israel aren't found, then they're not going to be in the kingdom and they're not going to see that glory. So Jesus is praying for all of Israel to be saved so that they may be part of his kingdom program <coughs> and be out of Satan's realm there where Satan was ruling. He'll be ruling no more. Uh, verse 25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known me, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Well, he says there in verse 26 that he has declared unto them thy name. Well, what is his name? His name is what we've seen in verse 11. He calls him Holy Father, and in verse 25 he calls him Righteous Father. So the aspect of God the Father that the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to the little flock is that he is holy and that he is righteous. The way G And Jesus says he declared his name. To, so how did he do it? He declared God to be holy and that he cast out the unholy devils and he healed the sick. And, that, and so you know, that's getting the unholy part, uh, getting rid of that and, as a sign of what he could do spiritually. And that's the righteous father part. So he declared the holy father part in saying that God, the Father, is holy and that anything unholy, the casting out of devils, the physical ailments there the, due to the curse of sin, that's cast out. So that's the holy father being declared to Israel. And then the righteous father being declared to them is the salvation that he brings to those believing the gospel. That they are, that the Pharisees, they were self-righteous, righteous in themselves, but they wouldn't be saved by that because their righteousness is as filthy rags. They are only saved by believing the gospel of the kingdom. And that is the that's God's righteousness. So the Father has so God Jesus declared the Father's name, his holiness, through the cleansing of the devils and the casting out devils, healing the sick, and he declares his name as righteous father, and that the Father brings righteousness to all those who believe the gospel. So let's change tapes now, and then we'll pick up in chapter 18. That gives me time to blow my nose at all these allergies I've had. Okay, we're live again and we're back John chapter 18 now we got one more chapter to cover Jesus has his prayer and verse 1 it says when Jesus had spoken these words he went forth with his with his disciples over the book brook Cedron where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples so now it's time Jesus shared with them from chapter 13 verse 31 through the end of chapter 16 he shared with them all the instructions they need to get through the tribulation period and to not uh, abandon Jesus at his death and his arrest chapter 17 he prays for them that they may endure through the tribulation period he prays for the lost sheep of the house of Israel now it's time for him to go to the cross he said back in uh, chapter Let's see. Um, we got a few scriptures here. Um, and I didn't write down the one I was looking for. But anyway, and John chapter 13 and verse 27, Jesus sent Judas Iscariot out. He says, uh, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. So he sends Judas out to go ahead and betray him. 
Remember, Jesus is God in the book of John, and so you see him in total control, even as he is being arrested and crucified. Jesus said in John chapter 10 that no man taketh his life from him, but he lays it down willingly. And so he commands Judas to go ahead and betray him. Uh, he says at the end of John 14, verse 31, he says the last five words there, he says, Arise, let us go hence. Because he realizes it's time for him to be betrayed. He knows that Judas is going to be going to the garden. Um, let's see if I look over in Luke 22. Hopefully I can find that passage. Yeah, Luke 22, verse 39. It says, uh, referring to Jesus there, it says, And he came out and went, and as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. That term, as he was wont, means that's what he normally did. And in fact, when we go over to John 18, you'll see there, uh, I think it tells you, um, I'm not, yeah, yeah, verse 2. It says, John 18, verse 2, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. So, Jesus sent Judas Iscariot to go betray him. During that time, Jesus went ahead and edified the little flock, edified his disciples. Then he prayed for them. Well, now, he's got to be crucified. It's time for him to lay down his life. Judas knows, as verse chapter 18, verse 2 says, Judas knows that Jesus would go after supper, that he would go to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And so, Jesus, knowing Judas would go there, and knowing that it's time for him to be betrayed and time for him to be arrested, Jesus specifically leads his disciples into that garden with the express purpose of him being uh, arrested and being crucified. So Jesus is, is in complete control. If Jesus didn't want to go to the cross, I mean, he could have just uh, went somewhere else because Judas, he knows Judas is going to go to the garden. He could have went the opposite direction. Do like uh, Jonah did. You know, Jonah, uh, God says, arise, go to Nineveh. Well, he takes a boat and goes to Tarshish. He goes the opposite way. Jesus could have done that, but Jesus, as God, is going to lay down his life freely willingly and he knows where judas is going to betray him and jesus is going to that place right when judas is there so that he could be be betrayed and be arrested and be killed according to the father's will verse 3 now jesus uh, judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons so they've got weapons there they're ready to try to kill him you can see they come in the dark of night and the fact that they've got lanterns with them verse 4 Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him as God he knows these things went forth and said unto them whom seek ye God often asks a question to convict the heart so that someone may repent and not do the evil and not disobey God uh, and so when he and so that's what he's doing there. Whom seek ye? Uh, the question, if you look you know, over in Genesis chapter 3, for example, and verse 9, when Adam and Eve fell, the first thing Jesus or what God says there, when he went to find Adam, you know, Genesis 3, verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Well, Jesus, or God knows where Adam is. But he asked him to convict him and saying, you know, where are you? And it's really a spiritual question. It's, well, I know you're behind, behind the bush there, but you know, where are you spiritually? You were in c communion with me. You were a, an innocent being. You, were, you had no sin, but now you are in Satan. Now you have fallen. That's where you really are. And so similarly, Jesus as God asked the question in John 18 verse 4, whom seek ye? Well, they're seeking Jesus. They're going to crucify him. But the spiritual application, the spiritual question is, whom do you seek? If you seek the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to believe the gospel, and you're not going to do this. You're not going to arrest him and crucify him on a cross. But rather, you're going to believe the gospel, and you're going to enter the kingdom. And so the question there uh, really is to convict their hearts over what they're about to do. They've got the weapons, and he says, you know, whom seek ye? Are, are, you, are you seeking the Messiah? Are you seeking to believe the, the gospel? Are you seeking God? 
or are you seeking your your father the devil as John 8 44 says so he asked the question whom seek ye verse 5 they answered him Jesus of Nazareth Jesus saith unto them I am he so you see there the I am meaning you know Jesus as God uh, goes back to Exodus uh, chapter 3 verse 14 where God reveals his name as I am that I am well this is the I am Jesus is saying that you know he is of course he is Jesus of Nazareth but I think that he specifically says I am he to give them a, a reference that you know I am God are you seeking God or are you seeking to kill God so he says I am he and Judas also which betrayed him stood with him so Judas is aligning himself with those religious leaders who are apostate he is not on God's side verse 6 as soon then as he had said unto them I am he they went backward and fell to the ground so that's the power of God there Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God is quick and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart uh, you know separating the joints and marrow it's, uh, it's, um, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart that's what it does there when God speaks it Jesus as God speaks here only John shows this happening them falling backward the power of God's word coming out of his mouth to them is it's he's already tried to convict them uh, through his words and their weapons that they bring are no match for the spiritual power of God's word such that physically speaking they fall backward the word of God to them convicting them that they they're not seeking God's will they're seeking the devil's will and that God has is there the fact that God speaks and he says I am that's enough to bring them backward and that right there should convict them because then in verse 7 then asked he them again whom seek ye so again he said it first to convict them to show basically you're following the devil's will you're not following what God wants you to follow believe the gospel you know that type of thing Judas knows the gospel the religious leaders have heard the gospel they know it and they are convicted in the fact that they fall backward when he says I am he so now Jesus gives them a second opportunity another chance not to do what they're about to do sure Jesus knows what's going to happen as God he knows he's going to be crucified but yet he gives them an opportunity so that they will not be thrown into the lake of fire for committing this great evil but rather they can still have the opportunity to enter God's kingdom they could they could not do this and someone else would step up to the plate and crucify Jesus um, so he gives them that opportunity but instead they say again Jesus of Nazareth so they don't say I'm seeking the Messiah they don't say I'm seeking the Lord they say Jesus of Nazareth this man we're gonna crucify this man so they refuse to believe verse 8 Jesus answered I have told you that I am he if therefore ye seek me let these go their way that the same might be fulfilled which he spake of them which thou gavest me have I lost none uh, we just read that in chapter 17 verse 12 he says I not lost any of those you've given me and so too um, he says that now it's interesting of course when Jesus says that in chapter 17 verse 12 he says I haven't lost those you've given me um, that's not a reference to their physical death it's referring to their spiritual condition there are these people who have been who have believed the gospel of the kingdom and so they would be saved but there's also the conditional aspect of the gospel of the kingdom in that they have to endure into the end they have to have the works um, involved with it enduring to the end in order to enter to God's kingdom even though they believe the gospel they are still at a point where they are they are about to be offended by the Lord Jesus Christ they're gonna they're gonna flee from him because they are trusting they were looking for the Messiah to come set up his kingdom on earth they weren't looking for him to be killed and so because of that they are offended in him and we went over that earlier and so they are they are because of that then they are as they are in even the little flock here the disciples are all in a lost condition at that point and so if the the religious leaders arrest them and then kill them along with Jesus they're not going to enter into the kingdom 
they're not going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel because they have been offended in the gospel. They've been offended in Jesus. And so in order that they are safe from that, because he says there, he says, let these go their way. In other words, they're going to have to be restored by Jesus. And we'll see that a little later if you look over in John 20, now 21. After Jesus' resurrection, he'll end up restoring them. In verse 15, it says, John 21, 15. So when they had died, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs, as a reference to feeding the little flock. And if you go over to Luke 22, Jesus said unto him, uh, in verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Say, so prays for them not to be his faith not to fail. But Simon Peter's faith is going to fail because he says, and when thou art converted, so you're converted back to believe in the gospel, strengthen thy brethren. The, the point is that the disciples are all, if they if they were to be killed with Jesus at this time. They would not believe he's the Messiah because they're trusting in religion. They would cease believing in the gospel of the kingdom. And so they would be they would be in a lost status. And those that the Father had given him then would be going to the lake of fire. They would not enter into the kingdom. So Jesus has them spared physically so that, as he says there in John 18, verse 9, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. They're saved physically so that after Jesus resurrection he restores them spiritually John 21 verse 15 he restores Simon Peter and as Luke 22 says after you're converted strengthen your brethren so Jesus converts Peter back to believe in the gospel back to being in a saved condition then Peter goes and he instructs the disciples the rest of, of the little flock so that they may also be strengthened, so that they may also be restored. And so Jesus saves, has them saved physically here from being killed, so that the scripture may be fulfilled of him saving them spiritually, so that they will not be lost. Verse 10 now, John 18, verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having his sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Simon Peter had earlier said, back in John 13, verse 37, Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. He was willing to lay down his life for Jesus' sake and the fact that he drew a sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear. I mean, if the high priest sends a servant to arrest somebody to kill that guy and someone cuts off that servant's ear, uh, that, that person's going to be killed too. Under the Roman law, that's what would happen. And so Peter knew, knew this, but yet he was willing to lay down his life. But yet he was only willing to lay down his life as long as Jesus fulfilled the vision of the Messiah that he had, that Jesus would set up the kingdom on earth right then. The fact that Jesus tells him in verse 11, put up thy sword into thy sheath, that I'm going to die, you know, I'm willingly going to die, that's not something Peter can handle. And now his vision of the Messiah is crushed at that point. He is a lost person at this point. And that's why he ends up denying his Lord. Verse 12 now, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Uh, we saw that back in chapter 11, verse 50. Caiaphas prophesied. He didn't know he was doing so, but he prophesied that Jesus would die uh, that all, so that all of Israel may be saved. Um, Verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Um, that other disciple is probably John. We're not told, but it's probably John. 
he has an in. He has a connection here with the high priest. So Simon Peter follows uh, him, at Jesus. So does John, probably. Verse 16, Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. So Peter, he's, he's crushed uh, that his Messiah, his vision of who the Messiah would be, has been dashed. And he's not going to set up his kingdom, but rather he's going to die. And so he's now in a status of unbelief, such that, you know, he does follow Jesus, but yet he doesn't go inside. He has to be sort of forced in by John here. Verse 17, Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. So there he denies the Lord. Verse 18, And the servants and officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Notice here, the, you know, we're told this for a reason. Back in verse 5, John 18, verse 5, when Judas Iscariot had the religious leaders come and they were all coming to arrest Jesus, it says there, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. So that little comment there is showing basically whose side Judas is on. Judas was with Jesus, but now he's standing with the religious leaders. He's standing with the with Satan's side. Well, so too, in verse 18, we're told, the last part there, Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So now we're told, Judas stood with the religious leaders against Jesus. Now, Peter is standing with the religious leaders against Jesus. He's joined Satan's side at this point. He's denied his Lord, and uh, you notice he's warming himself. That's really a sign also of the fact that you know he's pretty close to the fire, to the lake of fire. If he was to be killed at this time, he would go to the lake of fire. But that, and that's why Jesus had to make sure these that the disciples were not arrested and killed as well, because he's going to restore Simon Peter in John 21 verse 15, and he will be part of God's kingdom. <laughs> So Peter is warming himself by the fire. Uh, verse 19, The high priest then asked Jesus, Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly in, to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. This is really a slap in the face of the high priest. The Jewish religious leaders, the whole reason they've arrested Jesus and want to kill him is because Jesus has had some, the Jewish religious leaders have had power over the people. The people are bringing the tithes in. They're paying exorbitant prices for sacrifices on feast days. The, the religious leaders have the people's money and they have power over them. Jesus came. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Many people believed on Jesus. He's got a good following going here. Um, not at his death because they forsake him. But a lot of the people who were following the Jewish religious leaders and going to synagogue are now following Jesus. And that's why the Pharisees want to kill him because they're thinking, we're losing money, we're losing power. We need to get rid of this guy. And the fact that Jesus tells him, I taught in the synagogue where the Jews resort, and just ask the people. The people heard me. They know what I say. In other words, it's like it's like Jesus is showing them, "Hey, you know, I've taken people away from you. Uh, why don't you ask? Why don't you ask my followers what they think? What you know? What I've said. They know what I've said. They follow me now, not you. And that's really, you know, the the type of what Jesus is. You know, the hidden meaning behind what Jesus is saying. And that's why verse twenty two, the reaction. It says, when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by stroked Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? So notice Jesus says, God, he's confronting them. Really what's going on is uh, they broke the law by doing this. If you hold your place, go over to uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25 when it comes to they are supposedly following as religious leaders they are supposedly following God's law and uh, condemning Jesus to death and so he's on trial before the council before the religious leaders 
the religious leaders, if they're going to judge him according to the law, they should do so lawfully. Deuteronomy 25 verse 1 says, If there be a controversy between men, and they come into judgment, that the judges may judge them, that's what's going on here, they're judging Jesus, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And if it shall, and it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beating, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed. So the law says you bring somebody to, you judge them. You justify the righteous or you and you condemn the wicked. So you determine if they're righteous or wicked. But if you determine, once you determine that they're wicked, then if he's worthy to be beaten, then you can beat him. But what happened here, Jesus, the trial's just started. He hasn't been justified. He hasn't been condemned. Nothing's happened. And yet, they've already struck him. And so that's what Jesus is calling them out on that. He's saying, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. So in other words, you have to have two or three witnesses to establish that the person is wicked. So Jesus is saying, you know, you're, you're breaking the law here. The law says you got to have witnesses to establish that I've done evil. Then when you've established that I've done evil, then you can beat me. You can't beat me before the trial even starts. So it shows that the Jews, supposedly following the law and bringing him to trial, are a bunch of lawbreakers themselves. And uh, and so Jesus calls them on that. And as God, he's in control of the situation. Verse 24, Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. Uh, now verses 25 through 27, Simon uh, Peter denies the Lord Jesus Christ a second and third time and as he had prophesied so he's still in that status of being lost verse 28 then laid they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment so that's the so they've already judged him um, we're told in other accounts that they've uh, condemned him to death under under the Jewish religious law the Jews though only have the power to stone somebody they can't cruci crucify them so they lead him into uh, Pilate's Hall of Judgment. Pilate is the Roman governor so that they can get Pilate to condemn him to be crucified. So they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the Hall of Judgment and it was early and they themselves went not into the Judgment Hall lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. So you can see the religious hypocrisy of the Jewish religion here. They strike an innocent man contrary to the law. We saw that. Uh, Mark 14, verse 64 tells you that they condemned their Messiah, who is God in the flesh. They condemned him to die for blasphemy, for being saying he, saying he was God, when that's not the case. The law says you had to have two or three witnesses to show that he blasphemed. They don't have any witnesses, true witnesses, that that uh, that uh, confirm that. And so they've they've tried him. Un they've unfairly conducted the trial by striking him. They've tried him unfairly by saying that he is. they've condemned the righteous when we read over in Deuteronomy 25 verse 1 that they are to justify the righteous, condemn the wicked. So they've broken the law. They, they are defiled. But yet, under their religious system, they're, they'll be okay if, they, if they're not in the judgment hall. They, don't, they won't go to the judgment hall lest they be defiled so that they can eat the Passover. They got to be clean before they can eat the Passover. Well, these guys are definitely going to eat the Passover with defiled hands because they've they've already broken the law and how they've handled the trial. They've condemned the righteous, and they're going to be crucifying their God, their Messiah. So, but yet in religious eyes, they can come to the Passover and be justified, self-righteous, and say that they're they're okay. They've done nothing wrong because they didn't enter the judgment hall, so they're not defiled. The fact that they broke the law in other areas, much worse areas, doesn't matter. It's uh, according to their definition, they are ceremonially clean for the Passover, but according to God's law, they are not. Uh, as we've seen, they followed the tradition of the fathers and not God's commandment. So they won't go into the judgment hall, uh, which is interesting because really what you've got is Pilate, what's the only people in the judgment hall then would be Pilate. He's on the seat of judgment. And then you got all the soldiers, the Roman soldiers and the people in the court there but the people who are actually condemning Jesus the Jewish religious leaders they're not in the they're not in the court they're outside they won't come to the court unless they be defiled so the verse 29 Pilate went out unto them 
and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. So right there, that shows they don't have any cause to bring him. And, you know, if Jesus did something worthy of death, then they they would say, Oh, well, you know, he, he killed a hundred people. He did, you know, he was behind this massacre. He did this or that, whatever. They don't have anything. He has, as the scripture says, they've hated him without a cause. And so when Pilate asks, what's your accusation against this man? They don't have an answer. They say, well, you know, if he wasn't guilty, we wouldn't have brought him to you. <laughs> it shows that they, how unjustly they're going to be killing him. Now, verse 31, then said Pilate unto them, take ye him and judge him according to your law. So in other words, Pilate, he, he didn't want to handle this guy. Uh, they have the right, the Jews could stone him to death under their law uh, but the Jews are so filled with rage over Jesus and it's because the Jews as John 8 44 says they are of the devil and Jesus is of God he is God and so they are so filled with rage over Jesus that they don't just want him to die but they want him to die the most cruel and unusual uh, punishment that they could possibly have which was uh, death by crucifixion and that's why it said, they say there in verse 31, The Jews therefore sent unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. And again, you know, why are they concerned with law, you know, what's lawful? Um, and the fact that they've broken, they've already broken the law several times in handling Jesus. But they say this in verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. And that was over in John chapter 12, uh, verse 32. John 12, 32. Uh, he says, if, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So he said back there that he's going to die on a cross. And so that, that tells you, that explains to you what that means in verse 31 where Pilate says well judge him according to your law and the Jews says well it's not lawful for us to put any man to death they could stone someone to death Leviticus chapter 20 verse 2 verse 27 Leviticus chapter 24 verse 16 under God's law there they could stone somebody to death according to those passages and several others in the Old Testament so it's not that it's not lawful for them to kill somebody it's not lawful for them to kill somebody by crucifixion and that's what they're saying there when they say it is not lawful for us to put any man to death they're just talking about crucifying him and that's why it says the explanation is it signifies what death he should die not stoning but crucifixion which is what John 12 verses 32 and 33 say so verse 33 now then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him art thou the king of the Jews Jesus answered him Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? So again, you have Jesus uh, being in control here. And Jesus is the one on trial, supposedly, but he puts Pilate on trial here. He doesn't answer Pilate's question. and He says, did you say I'm the king of the Jews, or did, or did uh, the others tell that of, of you, uh, to tell that of me? Uh, tell that to you of me basically he's showing Pilate that you, know, you say you're the judge you're not calling the shots here someone else is calling the shots for you and as a judge as this position of authority that you have you should be judging a righteous judgment and so Jesus is really setting up for Pilate Jesus wanted the religious leaders to be saved because he asked that question whom seek ye and gave them yet a second opportunity with the second question that he asked him whom seek ye well he wants Pilate to believe the gospel and be saved as well so he gives Pilate an opportunity showing that you're allowing these religious leaders to control you you should judge a just judgment and if he judges a just judgment then he will see that Jesus is the that he's the Messiah that he is God that he is not worthy of death and then Pilate would end up becoming a believer and being part of God's kingdom uh, so that's what Jesus is getting that's why he says that he's trying to focus Pilate saying you're just being led by what man says you should be examining a just judgment here given a just judgment verse 35 Pilate answered 
Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So I referenced that verse before in explanation of a verse in John chapter 17. And let's go over to Revelation chapter 11, because that will help explain this in more detail. He says that Pilate said, asked him, Are you king of the Jews? And his basically he he is in the sense that he's king of the saved jews but he's not king of those jews who are trying to crucify him or that apostate nation as a whole because his kingdom is not of the jews there it's not of this world it is really of he says there at the end of verse 36 but now is my kingdom not from hence so if we look over in revelation 11 and verse 15 I need to get there myself revelation 11 verse 15 this is in the tribulation period. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So what Jesus is saying when he says, If my kingdom were of this world, then will my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. It's saying that really it's right now this God set up the nation of Israel to reconcile the earth back to himself. The world is going to be God's kingdom. And that's what Revelation 11 verse 15 says. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. So Jesus doesn't say these people here, this isn't my kingdom. He says it's not of the world. It's not of the world's system. It's from above. It's from God. And then, but when he says, but now is my kingdom not from hence, it's, what he's saying is that right now my kingdom is not from the world going out, but as Revelation 11 verse 15 says, it will be later on. When the tribulation period comes, Jesus judges the wicked. He, gets, he destroys the Antichrist and his system, overthrows him, then he sets up his kingdom on earth and the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reign over, over the entire universe from the world, from Jerusalem, from that very spot. Well, maybe not that spot, I don't know, but from, from Mount Zion, it, very close to where he is right then. So he's saying, basically, his kingdom is not of this world, of the world system, but yet all the kingdoms will be his and he is going to rule the entire universe from that spot, from Jerusalem. But he says, but now, right now, my kingdom is not from hence. It's not from the earth. It will be later, but right now it's not. And Revelation 11 shows you when it will be at his second coming. So Jesus has said that he is the king, just not of this world. And right now, he's not ruling from this world. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Um, I probably didn't read that correctly, with the correct emphasis, I should say, because you have Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. There's a period there. So he is a king, but that's not why he was born. And when you have a period, then a new thought or a new sentence comes. And he says, he says, okay, this is why I was born. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. So basically what Jesus is saying is, when Pilate asks him if he's a king, he's saying, well, yeah, it's true that I am a king, but that's not why I'm here. He says, to the end was the, the reason or the cause that I came into the world wasn't to establish my kingdom. It was to bear witness unto the truth. It was to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, bear witness, bring that witness out so that his kingdom could be established later. So while it's true that Jesus is a king, that's not why he's there. He was born to get people saved so that they could enter into the kingdom when he does establish the kingdom 
in the future and he says everyone that is of the truth those who do believe that he says he bear witness in the truth he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and everyone who has the believes in God over what God says over what man says is going to believe that gospel go back to God's law covenant be water baptized be saved and going to enter into the kingdom they're the ones who have the spiritual ears to hear Jesus voice Pilate's response there in verse 38 is one of what we see we see this a lot today he says there in verse 38 what is truth that's basically it's not that he's trying to find out what the truth is it's just a statement like what a philosopher would say today or what a lot of people today there's the God of relativism that people say that truth is relative a lot of people would contradict what John 14 6 says where Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life people would say well there are many ways to God or there are many truths and what's true for you yeah that's true to you but but I have a different truth and that's true to me truth is all relative it's whatever whatever you believe that's true to you and that's the idea that unfortunately you see so much in today's society that's not something new that the relativism and that there's no absolute truth uh, that you see today that was back in the Romans with the Romans 2,000 years ago it's like Jesus says I came to bear witness of the truth Pilate says well what is truth it's like well you know what's true to me isn't true to you and what's true to you isn't true to this other person there is no absolute truth so what are you doing what are you talking about you're coming to bear truth that's the philosophy of today and that was the philosophy 2,000 years ago among the civilized Romans so he asked the question what is truth and when he had said this he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them I find in him no fault at all it's not that Pilate is a believer it's just like and what you'll see today a lot of times I mean we've had this um, with people that, uh, that will you, know, you share you share that you're a Christian and you share uh, you know, the right division and a lot of people even if they claim to be Christians or they they don't really object to what you're talking about with the right division but yet they don't believe it and the reason they don't object is because of this idea of of relative truth that oh yeah that's great that you discovered that but something else is true for me and I'm going to follow that and when you have that attitude you don't really find fault in what others say because well that's true for you so I'm not going to criticize that but I just know it's not true for me so I'm not believing it and that's what that's where a pilot is he finds no fault in Jesus because he finds nothing under the law that would make him worthy of death or worthy of any crime but it doesn't mean that he believes the gospel because he just thinks truth is relative uh, I find it interesting and this is just a side note that you have in that court there in the judgment hall down at, in verse 28 we saw that the religiously Jewish religious leaders would not enter the judgment hall because they wouldn't be defiled by uh, so that they couldn't eat the Passover so the only people in the judgment hall his accusers aren't there the only people in the hall is Jesus and Pilate and then the soldiers and uh, the Roman soldiers and the, the the court there and Pilate you know in verse 29 he goes out to the religious leaders to find out the accusation and then here in verse 38 he goes out to the religious leaders to declare that he finds no fault at all in them and then he talks with them some and I just wonder you know, we're not told what goes on in that judgment hall but I could just imagine that Jesus because he came to bear witness of the truth he's probably sharing the gospel with those soldiers there in the court and so while, while Pilate's out there arguing with the religious leaders Jesus is still doing the work of his father trying to get people into the kingdom and and you'll see in uh, and in fact in uh, Matthew, uh, let's see, is it Matthew, oh, I know I wrote this down, yeah, Matthew 27, if you look at the account in Matthew 27, at the end of his crucifixion there, 
after he's hung on the cross and been crucified, you see things, you know, various things happening. The in verse 51, the temples ran in twain, the earth quakes, the rocks rent. Verse 52, graves are open. Uh, the, there's already been darkness in verse 45. It tells you there was three hours of darkness. Uh, verse 53, you have people coming out of their graves. Now notice verse 54, Matthew 27, 54 says, Now when the centurion and they that were with him, so those are the Roman soldiers, those very ones who would have been in that judgment hall. It says, Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Well, how did they know about you know being the Son of God? They didn't. They weren't following him around in his earthly ministry. They weren't in the temple when he taught. They were, you know, pagans. They were Gentiles. They were Romans, and they were. But you know, I just have to think that what probably happened as Pilate went out to talk to the accusers, Jesus was talking to those soldiers, and he told them. That, you know you you better not do this because I'm the son of God I'm the Messiah and that uh, I've come to save the world from their sins and you know as as Gentiles you should bless Israel so that you may be part of the kingdom or you know become proselytes obey God's law and become a, a Jew that way so that you may be part of the kingdom and he probably shared with them such that you have a centurion and those with them saying you know truly this was the son of God so you got to wonder, was would they have come to that conclusion if the Jewish religious leaders did not go into the judgment hall? But the fact that he has Jesus has some alone time with these Roman soldiers, uh, there may be some of them in the kingdom uh, just because Jesus was able to witness to them while Pilate was having a conversation with the religious leaders. So that's it, we don't know. There's no record of it, but it just it just seems interesting. I think that's a definite possibility that that could could be exactly what's happening. Uh, Jesus would have witnessed to those soldiers. Uh, so, uh, verse thirty nine, Pilate speaking to the religious leaders, John eighteen thirty nine. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the King of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And so you have here a type. For us and for Israel, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All are worthy of death. In God's eyes, they should receive eternal death in the lake of fire. But yet, if we believe the gospel that we are given by God, we receive life instead of death because the Lord Jesus Christ died in our place. So too, Barabbas, being a robber, was worthy of death, but yet he is let go and Jesus dies in his place. So that's just a type of um, the salvation that Jesus brings to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, or to, I should say, saved Israel, those who believe in him. So that's where we stop there. Basically, chapter 18, a summary of that is that now that Jesus is, um, he is betrayed, he is arrested, he's sentenced to death, they unjustly sentence him. Uh, Peter even joins the side of the religious leaders, as we saw and it's really showing a type of how the entire nation of Israel has forsaken Jesus. Peter is also a type in that part of those people who believe the gospel of the kingdom, but yet when the apostate Israel threatens to kill them in the tribulation period, they are offended in Jesus, they forsake the gospel, and they align themselves with the Antichrist. For Peter, though, he's restored by Jesus later. For those people who forsake, the, uh, forsake Jesus Line themselves to the Antichrist by worshiping the image of the beast, uh, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. And then finally, you have um, basically the entire nation of Israel has forsaken Jesus. They all find fault in him, except for a Gentile, a Pilot, the Roman governor, who finds no fault in him. So next week we'll pick up, we'll conclude the book of John, where John is cru uh, Jesus is crucified, his resurrection and restoration of the little flock so that they may uh, continue Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, they can continue building up Jesus' ministry, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, through the Holy Ghost, uh, and that will take place in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so let's close tonight with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross, and as we know, 
as you revealed in due time to our uh, Apostle Paul, that you died for our sins as well, so that we may be saved and have eternal life, not on God's kingdom on earth, but in those heavenly places. We thank you for that. We thank you for your, for your sacrifice, and help us, Lord, always to trust in that and trust to have faith in your word and not go to religion and not go to the flesh, but trust in you to guide us into all truth that we may live for you, that you may live through us and bear the fruit of the Spirit through us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us next week. I'm going to have to make the broadcast on Sunday night at 6 p.m. rather than Monday uh, due to a work meeting I've got next Monday. So next Sunday night, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we will conclude the book of John, picking up in John chapter 19. Until then, uh, God bless. <laughs>